Well, good evening. Hope you've had a good day this afternoon and uh, got everything that you needed to do done on this Palm Sunday. I um, want to talk to you tonight a uh, passage of scripture out of Acts chapter 5 and we'll read verses 11 through 16. It's a time in the life of the church where um, really Peter was the um, leader of the church. He was, um, he had preached at Pentecost and 3,000 was saved and preached again at um, just after Pentecost. The stories recorded in Acts chapter 4, 5,000 were saved. He had preached and taught in the temple and um, they had received him, uh, received the message. He was leading the church to take care of his of its members. They had, um, well, begun to live communally. They had, Barnabas had sold his property and they had given to uh, those in need and they were taking care of all of these people who had come from um, all over the world, really, the Jews who had come from Pentecost or for Pentecost and had been saved and they decided to stay in Jerusalem. And so they were taking care of these people and the disciples, the leaders were taking care of these families and the church was growing and the Peter and John were praying for boldness that they could preach the gospel despite persecution and everything that um, that they had experienced that they would continue to preach. And Peter was their leader. And so in Acts, the um, fifth chapter, um, well, Barnabas had given, sold his property, given the proceeds to the church. And uh, Ananias and Sapphira, that story is just before this passage we're going to read, that they sold some property and lied about how much they got for it. And um, it seems as though they were seeking the praise of men. And uh, God killed them both. Um, and the Bible says in verse 11 in chapter 5, And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things, and you would expect that it would, that fear came upon the church. Then verse 12, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes, both men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time that we can join together. Thank you for this um, technology to be able to do that. We don't understand all of this, but we're grateful that your word will accomplish what you have purposed it to do. And so we trust you and trust your spirit. Pray that you would be glorified in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you just a few minutes tonight on uh, what kind of shadow are you casting? What kind of shadow are you casting? When our kids were small and <laughs> maybe when Jackie and I were by ourselves, we watched Walt Disney movies, uh, the old ones. Uh, one of my favorites is Peter Pan and in Peter Pan he loses his shadow and he tries to catch it and uh, stick it on with soap or sew it back on. But the shadow 
is caused by the light coming and reflect or not reflecting but the light shining against you and your outline causes that shadow from the direction uh, or it points in the opposite direction of where the light is coming from and so Peter had become such a man of God that people were bringing sick people so that his shadow could just pass by them and they would be healed. And so are we casting the right kind of shadow? First of all, I think we ought to cast a shadow of reverence. These disciples and these apostles were changed. They were not the fearful people that had hid in the garden, who had run from Jesus, who had left him at the cross. They were rejuvenated. They had received power after the Spirit had come, and their desire was not for their own physical safety or for anything other than the spread of the gospel. If they got a chance, they told about Jesus. They believed everything that God had said. The writer of Hebrews tells us that we should fear. He tells the story about the children of Israel. They came to the very edge of the promised land, yet they didn't believe, and that's the reason they didn't get to enter in. And so the writer of Hebrews says that we should fear, lest a promise being left to us of entering into his rest, any of you seem to come short of. In other words, don't stop. Be committed be reverent. Fear the Lord. That was a sign of someone who was following God, the reverence they had because they were following him. Samuel came to anoint David as king of Israel in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And because, well, the Bible says, and Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I'm come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and he called them to sacrifice. It's a shame that the men of God don't have that reverence among the people anymore, that their life is so different that people notice that difference. They're not casting that shadow of reverence. Paul told Timothy, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and suitable for the master's use. We have to have that sense of reverence about us before we can cast a shadow of reverence for others to see before we're fit for the master's use. Peter and the other disciples were living in such a way that people didn't just frivolously join the church. They had just seen two people carried out dead who had lied to the Holy Spirit, and it was a serious thing. These disciples cast a shadow of reverence and fear. It was like the people, the Israelites, did with Moses. When Moses went and spoke to God, he came back and his face shone. And it made, well, really it made the people, the Israelites, uncomfortable because they could tell Moses had been with God and they hadn't. And they said, Moses, you have to cover your face. We can't stand the disparity. Moses cast 
a shadow of reverence. He wore the veil over his face until he went back to meet with the Lord. The Bible says God knew Moses, or God spoke to Moses as a man speaks to his friend face to face. The people of God and preachers especially need to return to that shadow of reverence. Will Rogers supposedly said, Live in such a way that you would not be ashamed to sell your parrot to the town gossip. I'm afraid we wouldn't want to make that transaction. We wouldn't want to sell our talking parrot to the town gossip. These disciples worship God, serve God. They feared God. And because of that, they cast a shadow of reverence. Secondly, not only a shadow of reverence, but a shadow of restoration. They, the people brought the sick and hurting of the church to these men, and they were healed. Now, I believe that these apostles had the gift of healing um, that God gave them to sort of launch the church. They didn't have the written word at this time, at least the New Testament. And God gave them these um, acts of healing or the power to heal in order to launch the church and to confirm the word that they spoke. Um, in Acts 19, the Bible says God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul. He even raised a man from the dead after he preached too long and he fell out the window. But physical healing was not the most important thing. Jesus sent out the 70, we call it, in Luke chapter 10. And he sent these out and he gave them power over sat satanic uh, attacks, over illnesses, over diseases. And they came back. And when they came back, it says the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So Jesus gave these apostles this supernatural power, but he says, notwithstanding in this rejoice not. Don't be excited because you have power over the devil, because you have power over diseases. Even if you could heal people, that's not what you should rejoice in. Jesus said, don't rejoice that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. It was a, they had the miraculous power to physically heal people, but they had a message that could spiritually heal people. So it was more than the gift of healing. It was uh, a shadow of healing, but it was also a shadow of helping they helped others beyond the physical healing. They loved and cared for them. Jesus told the disciples, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Because we have the Holy Spirit now living with us, Jesus said, I'm going to send another one just like me, who will come and he'll remind you of all the things I've taught you. And because of him, you'll be able to do greater things than I have done. And I think that's much more than the, the physical healing. We can share the message with people all over the world, as hard as it is to believe this little simple message tonight. Somebody uh, in, on the other side of the world can hear this. Uh, God's word can go out through um, and because of the Holy Spirit. And if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, you might remember an illustration or a story or, or something that I told, but it would do no good unless the Spirit confirmed that word and convicts of sin and changes a heart because there's nothing that I can do um, in myself to really to help you, certainly not to save you, unless the Spirit works and convicts 
and convinces. So we can do greater things than physically heal people because, as Jesus said, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and yet lost his soul? We can help those who have spiritual needs and we can share the word with them. That's what the apostles did. They cast a shadow of reverence. They cast a shadow of restoration. And they cast a shadow of remembrance. All through the Bible, it tells us to remember the things that God has done. That's the reason I think we have Bible study. That's the reason we have sermons is to hear what God did. And because of what God did in the past, we can live in the present until we see him again in the future. And that's our hope. God commanded the Israelites to remember what he had done for them. We're supposed to remember the past. When they crossed the Jordan River, they took some rocks out of the river and moved them to the other side, and they took some rocks from the other side and moved them into the river and stacked them up. And God told Joshua, in the years to come, when your children ask you, hey, what does this pile of rocks mean? You can tell them, this is what God did. All through the book of Joshua, we studied in our church not too long ago, probably longer than I think, about those standing stones that they stood up as a memorial of what God had done for them in the past. And that's that's why we read, that's why we study what God has done. So we can remember what he's done in the past and we can know what he's doing now, what he's doing in the present. We don't need to be so caught up in the past that we're, uh, we forget to be obedient now. We don't need to remember the good old days. Vance Hadner told a story about a, a man who wrote a letter to a magazine editor and he told him, your magazine's not as good as it used to be. And he replied back and said, it never has. We can remember with fondness and maybe even exaggeration those good old days, and we can live in the good old days and not live in the days that we have now. We are to live in the present because of what God has done in the past. The writer of Hebrews says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So that's what Christ has done in the past. We have a high priest, not like the high priest that the Hebrews had that offered the sacrifices over and over and over again. And he didn't really have any idea what this person had done, how they felt. But the writer of Hebrews says we have a high priest that's different than that. We have a high priest that's touched with our infirmities. He knows what we've been through. He's been through the same thing yet without sin. And so since we have that high priest, since Christ has done what he did in the past, the writer of Hebrews says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Because of what Christ has done in the past, because of what God has done in the past, we can come to him boldly in the present for grace that we need in a time of need. And then we're to, I think, remember what God is going to do. We talked about a few weeks ago, we shall see him. We don't know what we'll be like, but we know we'll be like him because we shall see him even as he is. The Passover was... Uh, an example of that. In Exodus chapter 12, the Bible says that the Israelites were supposed to get all their stuff ready. They were supposed to pack up and be ready to go. That's the reason they ate, one of the reasons they ate unleavened bread. They didn't have the things that they needed to set up to make leaven or uh, 
bread the way they typically did. They just made it plain uh, with no yeast or rising in it at all. And so this plain bread they were supposed to eat, they were supposed to get a lamb and put it aside and watch it. And then on the 14th day of the month, they were to kill the Passover and they were to take the blood of that animal and they were to put it on their door of their house in Egypt. Because God says the destroyer is coming. And when I see the blood applied, I will pass over. And God says um, that you will observe this forever. Your sons, you and your sons will observe this forever and it shall come to pass when you come into the land which the Lord your God will give you according as he hath promised that ye shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass when your children say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the house of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptian and delivered our house. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. Paul says that Christ is our Passover in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He records that First Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And Jesus says, As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. And so we have that shadow of remembrance. We celebrate, we drink the cup and eat the bread in the present. And we do it to show the Lord's death in the past, and we do it until he comes again in the future. So we have all that in the Lord's Supper. What about us? What kind of shadow are we casting? Is it showing the people is it showing those we come in contact with the sun? Is it a place of shelter, of healing and helping for those who are hurting and in need? Is it a shadow of remembrance for what Christ has done? Our shadow, our physical shadow, changes. Sometimes it's short, sometimes it's Long, the difference is determined by our relationship to the sun. So our shadow, our spiritual shadow in this case, is determined by our relationship to the S-O-N, son of God. What kind of shadow are we casting? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for an opportunity to study your word. Thank you for your spirit to teach us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to examine ourselves and to see what type of shadow that we're casting. Are we close to the sun that the light might shine forth, that your work would be done by us. Lord, we pray that you would glorify yourself in us, that each thing we do would be in reverence and honor of you. We pray that it would be to help somebody else, that they might remember what you have done. Lord, I just pray that you would be glorified in this time and if there's one that doesn't know you that they would say yes to your invitation to come to you we thank you for all this in jesus name amen well i wanted to share just another um uh, thing with you uh we're in different times and uh we're doing things different than I've ever done it before. And so um, 
I talked to several people at churches that have done this, and they um, they make a little communion cup that comes with a, the juice and the bread already in it. And uh, so I decided I would look online and find that. I could there was none, so apparently everybody did that. But what I would like for you to do is on Thursday night, uh, I want us to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, and we'll share here in our house and you share there in your house um i'm gonna try a little uh, lady at our church years ago at antioch used to make unleavened bread it's not too hard you just put bread and i guess i mean flour uh plain flour and water together it's not too tasty it's not very good it is pure doesn't have any yeast in it so I'm going to try to make some here. You can do that if you have a cracker or a regular piece of bread. Uh, if you have some grape juice, that'll be fine. Uh, whatever you have, we're going to do that in remembrance of that first Passover or that first Lord's Supper. What I like to call the last Passover and the first Lord's Supper on Thursday night uh, at 7 o'clock. So if you can join us then, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together on the church calls it Monday, Thursday. So if you're uh, available and would like to join us then, we're going to try to do that and have the Lord's Supper together on Thursday. We'll have our Bible study on Wednesday again, so hopefully you won't get tired of, uh, of all this. But let's, uh, let's try to do that on Wednesday, and then again on Thursday we'll have the Lord's Supper together. And again, you just share there in your house, and we'll be together uh, in the Lord. All right, thank you very much, and we'll see you on Wednesday.